I'm your host, DJ, along with my brother from one other, the executive producer, the technical director, and the brains behind the joint. Put them together for money, Nathan. Hey, what's up, everybody? Good to be with y'all. Happy Tuesday. Excited about this show. Second edition of Off the Meter. It's going to be a good time. Yep. Thank you, Matt Knapp, <laughs> for coming up with this name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Check out Matt Knapp on Bigfoot Crossroads. The guy's a damn genius. Um, secondly, uh, the other, uh, regular co host of this joint, when we're not bringing on party people like we have tonight is the Paragon of Virtue, our researcher, the brilliant one, the one, if you don't know her in the community, gotta check yourself. And that is a study of UAP's devs. Hi everybody. Happy Tuesday. Good, Good evening. Oh girl. Um, so devs, as it turns out has this new format that our other special guest tonight might actually take part in because he bought some debate, okay? That's how he got his doctorate. Uh, and this this young lady right here, Inquire, uh, or wait, it's called Anomalous Abates. I almost said Inquire Anomalous. Anomalous isn't too many show titles. This is, <laughs> so Anomalous Debate, um, she is a regular on Spaced Out Radio with my homie Dave Scott, and she is none other than my Italian homegirl from the neighboring state, Courtney Marcassani. Woohoo! Can I get it? Amen. Amen. Welcome. Amen. She's <laughs> like, what I just jump into? <laughs> hey, party people. Hey. I'm down. I'm down with go. the format. Yeah, there we go. And we just heard about what kind of athlete she is. So don't go up to her trying to play no games if you see her at some sort of a symposium. Uh, because even though she's getting her doctorate, she'll buck you over the head with a softball. <laughs> <Spice. laughs> or spice. I was known, I was known for certain tactics of intimidation over the net when I was waiting at the net. So yeah. Oh man, Tim. It's called talking better... smack. <laughs> Tim, man, you better look at <laughs> and here. The host of ATU, All Things Unexplained, our brother and sister show, who uh, we've appeared on together. Absolutely love these guys. They are so cool and so much fun. Dr. Tim Mounts! Yes, sir. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's really great to be back. I'm super excited. I want to give a shout out to Deb, who was kind enough to indulge me. I'm writing an article, and she's going to be a part of it. So stay tuned on that. Oh, look at the Thank doctor. You. Doctor's hours, man, going on right now. Man. All right. <laughs> All right. So, uh, <laughs> money. <laughs> we're going to have so much fun tonight. Money, Nathan, man. I Sir. want you to kick this off, and then we're going to go to Tim because he got chillings to deal with, and then we'll kind of go on that counterclockwise rotation, if that's Sounds okay. Good. Sounds good. So, uh, it's good to be back, and I know all of you guys have been uh, really kind of tracking with the UFO stuff recently. There's not a ton that's been happening in 2024. It seems like it's been a little bit calmer, a little quieter, but there is a lot of rumor going on of things happening behind the scenes. And I'm just kind of curious, um, what do you guys think is going to be the next sort of breaking soundbite or maybe not soundbite, but who do you think we're going to hear from next in this year in terms of a big kind of announcement or news issue? So the way this will work just for, for GPs is our uh, general purpose is Tim. So it's going to go in that same rotation. So it'll be you and then Debs and Courtney and myself. Okay. So might have still a little bit of my thunder now. So it's perfectly <laughs> fine. I'm not going to get into my 
<laughs> first answer, I'm going to go to my second answer because I've heard rumors from authorities on high that the James Webb Space Telescope has got some groundbreaking, earth-shattering news that they are preparing for release, and we're talking about potential discovery of nothing short of proof of alien life forms. Now, I don't know if we're talking just like chemical signatures, which I feel I'm afraid that the general population may or may not, you know, like run for the hills just because we discover some chemical signatures of life. Or if we're talking about, you know, actual signals or other signs of intelligence or life. But I did hear it from good authority and look out because, I mean, this thing costs a lot of money and it's doing some work that the James Webb Space Telescope has got some earth shattering news coming in 2024. So I think that you're going to hear more from that. And if I if I can hold it off for one second, just because I want to just say hello to some people in the chat. Anon E.T., what's up, Holmes? How are you? K.K. Nichols in the building. Uh, and my man, Daniel Lee Barnett. Who really is just Daniel Barnett? He's gonna be on. What's up, brother? He's gonna be on soon on a roundtable, and we're gonna have his whole crew from uh, from uh, the UK, his Bigfoot research team. Um, so let me let me pass it. I think the next person is Debs. So I think that we're gonna want to look out for some documentaries. Like, I don't want to get into the details on it too much, but there's a quiet stir about some of the people that will be interviewed in some of those documentaries. So I would particularly be attending to what James Fox is going to put out probably this year. And of course, I think Lou's book is supposed to come out this year. So Lou Elizondo for anyone who might not know who that means. But yeah, so that's those are the two things that I think are going to happen this year. Wow. Um, and now it goes to Miss Courtney. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to echo what Deb said. You know, I think that there is the documentary, the film documentary that's maybe going to be coming out this year. There was some scuttlebutt last week about uh, Lou Elizondo's book, and then that was, you know, retracted. And so I actually contacted Lou Elizondo's producer in a bold move asking for clarity. Like, you need to tell us, you know, like media requests usually have this typical protocol that you followed. So, you know, I contacted him and he said, you know, you can't trust anything. It was fake news. Um, it's still on track. But I do think, you know, Deb's right. I think that's going to come out this year. So that's a big one. I also think we might have some field hearings based off of the testimony that went to Monheim and the skiff. I think that might be something that we can look forward to in terms of uh, disclosure processes and the legal the legal process where that's going to be held. I'm not sure yet, but there's some scuttlebutt that it might be around Lockheed Martin or North of Grumman. So I think we might have that to look forward to. And then there's also another thing that's happening behind the scenes. I mean, some stuff has been released about this, but there's probably going to be another movie about the aviary. So there's Ooh. some, you know, there's some documentaries that are going to be hitting some of these old historical groups that have been working for a long time on these issues. So that's Dang. what I have. I would have like three more questions for you just based on that one right there. But uh, I will say this, you know, whenever uh, Courtney does get her doctorate degree, we're going to have her on and we're going to play. They call me Dr. Love from Kiss to open the show. Nathan, is that okay? Sure, man, whatever. <laughs> Look, I was terrified by Kiss, okay? I was young when they used to do their performances, and for whatever reason, that just scared the bejesus out of me, Kiss. I mean, now I'm more appreciative of it, but I have to tell you this. I was at a Pearl Jam concert just quickly and um, in Seattle, and uh, Mike McCready apparently thought the words were, I want to rock and roll uh, and part of every day. <laughs> And so everybody was like, the best, you know, lyrics mix-up I ever heard was Mike McCready saying... I want to rock and roll all night and part of every day. So mm -hmm. since we're the party people, it's good to know our lyrics. Yeah. It's it's Courtney, that well. is a major party more foul. On, that is a major party foul on, the, yeah, on sure. a member of Pearl Jam. It's it's very wow. responsible, though. It's not like all day. It's just, just part of every day. Uh, I, I guess so. Maybe he's from the responsible era. Okay. Uh, Money Nathan. Uh, <clears throat> so you ask a great question to, to open us up. 
uh, to get people kind of get, get the juices flowing. But I mean, obviously I think we've all heard about the, the crush op-ed. Um, and, uh, so I think that that's, you know, going to come out and I think there will be some more whistleblowers. Um, I don't know if they'll be as powerful their, their testimony as, as David's, uh, was, uh, I think, you know, Courtney's doing some research on that. So before very long, uh, you may get something, uh, from her on uh, spaced out radio about that. Um, but yeah, I, it's, it's funny. It is, it is kind of quiet right now. Uh, but if Lou's book is released, if he comes back in the media combined with a grush, um, a grush op-ed, uh, to oppose maybe that, that arrow, uh, report, then that could generate more people to want to come forward. Um, you, you know, we had hoped last year that it would happen sort of quickly that they would come to sort of reinforce his testimony. I, we were praying that was going to happen because I don't want the guy to be there kind of facing the music all by his lonesome, but it seems like that's kind of what's happened, but, but perhaps not for too long. So, um, great, great question, sir. Yeah. And I would just, um, quickly, I had a couple things too. So one, I would say, uh, and a bit of cold water that might be coming up would be this Sean Kirkpatrick, uh, the, well, the Arrow report, you know, so that we're hearing that that may be coming out as early as next week. Um, and I think the expectations are that it's going to be pouring a lot of cold water on, you know, the, the, the topic and kind of sort of stifling the momentum. It's weird. We have this strange juxtaposition of uh, where things that we're hearing from, from Arrow and, and Kirkpatrick specifically, who's been very vocal, even more vocal, I would say, after he's left the position, that are really saying there's nothing to see here, that this is all kind of a concocted uh, game of telephone from a group of insiders over many decades who have just sort of hoodwinked lawmakers into thinking that there's something here um, when really all of us are hearing on the opposite side, those of us who are interested in the UFO side, we're hearing some really bold claims from people who like people like Jim Simiman who are saying he knows folks within agencies who are, you know, know this is absolutely real. Uh, you know, that the government just doesn't want to talk about it. Doesn't know how to talk about it. We've heard that many, many times that mm -hmm. there are people in high places that uh, recognize that this is, there is something here, but that maybe they just don't quite know how to deal with it. So these two kind of claims are, a little bit confusing and, and at odds with one another. And I think we just, what we, what I'm hoping for is more uh, sort of evidentiary releases, more whistleblower testimony that really kind of puts to bed some of these uh, disagreements. And that way we can move forward in a productive way. Cause right now it's a lot of sort of like he said, she said um, with these two factions. So I'm hoping that we can resolve that and move ahead. Now, I think the Grush op ed, you know, what you mentioned DJ is sort of that, hot water you know so we might have this cold water situation then a hot water release but we heard today from uh, christopher sharp in the liberation times who said that apparently the op-ed was submitted to dobster two months ago but they're basically sitting on it and preventing him from saying certain things that he wants to say so that'll be interesting how long does that take when does it get released how close is it in conjunction with this arrow report you know how do they sort of play off one another you know i'm looking forward to seeing really kind of how all that plays out. Um, yeah, Nathan, what, what's interesting is the worst outcome that we thought when they um, sort of renamed and rebranded that office as Arrow. And we thought this was a possible outcome. And this is actually, I think, the as, as bad as we thought it uh, possibly could be, that it would be some sort of a cover agency for, for the story. Uh, to to keep uh, the information close hold, to try to uh, get rid of and chaff away these experiencers, uh, these military experiencers and people from from industry that uh, apparently had contacted them, not the least of which is David Grush. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, it, it's the worst possible outcome. And if you heard the tape, it was played on Martin Willis's uh, Crossfire episode. I highly recommend everybody go and listen to uh, Martin Willis's uh, podcast UFO Crossfire. There are some high-level guys in there with some great information, older school guys that are not, you know, your current guys that are kind of bopping around Twitter, kind of just, you know, doing this, but guys that have been around quite a while. 
uh, not, and Dave Scott was one of them. Uh, and they played Jeremy Corbell and I'm not going to use the four letter expletive as a, a preface to what he said, but he just said that he's, he's a effing liar essentially. Um, and it reminds me of what I thought when they had those Senate hearings, I want to say it was 22 and it was, uh, Scott Bray and Ron Moultrie. And when they, that Congressman asked him the question about mail, Malmstrom uh, Air Force Base and that incident with Bob Salas, had he heard of it? And he said that uh, they hadn't heard of it. I just said, you know, you're a liar. You're just an absolute liar. It was an incident at a nuclear facility. There's no question that you hadn't uh, any, um, that you hadn't heard of it and, and that it's not, you know, quite well known that 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 has happened in on more than one occasion so if, um being seeing as i you know had to if anybody else has some unsaved rounds and you want to go around again uh with that one do you have anything to add tim uh deb and, and courtney on that before we go to the next yes one? so i wanted to point out and i really wish i could remember which podcast it was mentioned on but someone mentioned how interesting it was that anyone else working for the government has to go through that officer process to be able to put something out but kirkpatrick's came out in like a minute and they basically said they think he was sitting on it had already gone through the officer process and then waited to release it so I, I think that's a little bit conspiratorial, but it's something to just add as a comment to think about. Like, he's a government employee. He went through the same process. Why did his article drop when it did? So just wanted to throw that out there. Courtney, you wanted to say something as well? Yeah, I just had an aside on the report. You know, everybody's asking, do you think this report's going to be worth anything? And, you know, <laughs> I, I, I am curious. I'm curious about some of the historical reporting in this report and what some of the results or conclusions might be if there's anything new. One of the cases that I'm interested in seeing about is Trinity, because, of course, we know that the book was written by, you know, Jacques Vallée and Paola Harris. And then that was highly disputed by a couple of investigators who went through and looked at their witnesses and kind of debunked some things. And so I'm interested in seeing more information, if there is any, you know, in that historical report about Trinity and other cases that are similar. So that's just one of my sides. Yeah, no, that's plus Courtney, point. I was gonna say you might need Tinder for your fireplace if it's no good. So that there's always that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, but you bring up a good point, and this is the last thing I'll say on it, um, Courtney, and that's that uh Kirkpatrick has alluded to a lot of historical um projects, secret projects, SAPs that that pre present or a uh, sort of counter narrative to some of the common claims or events that people cite in history. You know, this was seen, this is this was a UFO, et cetera. And he's alluded to the fact that maybe these were secret projects that just weren't really made public. So, okay, that's a that's a pretty big claim as well. So, all right, well, let, let's put the cards on the table and let, let's see what those projects were. Let's, you know, can we evaluate them and and then make a judgment on that? You know, is was this in fact some sort of black project? You know, what was the nature of it? I know that that's difficult because obviously 40s <laughs> yeah i mean it's a long time ago how much does the government want to reveal are these black projects still sensitive to a certain degree there's a lot of ifs there but i think it would be helpful if we're talking about transparency and trying to shine some light on this to get more of the facts out on the table so people can make an evaluation hi facebook user thank you for joining us tim do you have something sir yeah i'll add something to that real quick first one of my favorite quotes from the aforementioned Mr. Moultrie. So some of that I think, sir, will say for closed session. And I think that's the majority <laughs> of what we're going to get from the government and the military. If we're expecting anything else, anything more from the government military, we can just hang it up. We can wait, wait around, you know, until we're gray and old. We're not going to hear any more from the government military. But where I would hang my hat to find out more is our group. We have a group of dedicated scientists and physicists out there who are studying the ufo phenomenon i'll call it and instead of reading useless pointless aero reports i would encourage people to check things out like the paper by kevin knuth and uh, colleagues pal and reality he has a paper you can google this online estimating flight characteristics of anomalous unidentified aerial vehicles this dives into a deep a physics study 
of the Nimitz incident and the Tic Tacs, right? And the physics and the mathematics that they discovered surrounding this incident are nothing short of truly shocking and should be proved to all of us. And even Kevin Knuth himself says, hey, we've got a problem. This is a situation and it is serious. Some of the things that they discovered, and by the way, they discovered this independent of each other. So that's pretty powerful right there, which is why they collaborated on the paper because they realized that essentially all three of them have gotten the same findings. The Tic Tac UFOs were roughly the size of an F-18. They dropped from approximately 25,000 feet in altitude to sea level in, you know, just like less that, than one less than yeah. one second. The energy that it would have taken for a craft to make those maneuvers was, and I kid you not, equal to the entire nuclear output of the United States. The energy that would have been released from something of the mass that this object or objects had to be, and by the way, they were tracking them for at least two weeks that they knew of, is roughly approximately 250 Tomahawk missiles. Okay, and this is according to some of the most brilliant minds out there that we have a problem, folks. Don't don't waste your time with pointless government reports. We got scientists out there putting in hard work. I, I don't know about you, Tim, uh, Courtney wants to get in there. I just want to say before you go, I'm very interested to see Courtney and Tim meet at the net in volleyball. I mean, that that's what I'm focused on right now. I mean, and you see, I mean, the Mohawk, is that going to be an issue for you, Courtney, or no? Will you still... No, I've seen everything. I've gone up against girls, you know, that are like six foot and bigger and taking them down. So I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. You're of not worried about Tim. Okay, Tim. Yeah, well, there we go. I'm not. I just have Masters. to say, uh, uh, following yeah. up on that is, you know, another thing that Kevin Knuth brought up at the Soul Symposium was the um, the inadequacies of the U.S. Uh, ability to do tracking underwater on the USO. So I just wanted to add on to that, the great compelling report, the information, the tracking. And then he kind of said, this is an area where we're really lacking. You know, there's sonar information, there's sonar data, but we don't really have any other way to track the underwater submersible stuff. So I just wanted to add that on. So there is, there is one more other piece to that that, um, Mark D'Antonio was talking about on that episode that Dave was on and he was talking about, um, basically it's a sonic, it's a, it's a, uh, he said that it can hear whales flatulate <laughs> this, <laughs> this, uh, un these underwater sensors that we have to be able to track, uh, any sort of an underwater sub or anything that would be approaching like the continental shelf. Um, uh, so, or the eight is or whatever. So it, that's interesting. It's, you know, another thing, but we're going to have on, uh, let's see, April 3rd, uh, we're going to have Darcy Weir, uh, the director of Transmedium. He said he's bringing a special guest. Hopefully it's Admiral Kelly. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, we're going to get into it. So, yeah. And if you end up wanting to join us for that, uh, Courtney, and get into that, let me know, and, and we'll we'll have you on as well. So are uh, you ready to go to the second, second topic, everybody? Let's do it. Yeah. Tim. What you got? Make it short and sweet. Don't give no 10-minute no question here. No, no, no. So I just want to bring up a quote, and I'm going to stick with Nathan here, kind of current events here. Nietzsche mm -hmm. said, whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process he does not become a monster. And if you gaze long enough into an abyss, the abyss will gaze back into you. And we all have our own anomalous pursuits. So I think we're all going to have strong opinions on this. This is breaking news as of today. And I'm going to see if I can share my screen here, see what will happen. Will it break? Nope, I think that. Oh, can somebody pull that up for me, what I just shared? Yeah, let me check out here. Hold on. This was on Twitter today, breaking news. There we go. This morning from D.W. Oh. Pasulka, Diana Pasulka, a producer from The Game of Thrones has optioned her books, American Cosmic and Encounters, to develop a TV series. More to come, and you can't see it here, folks, but the very first comment was from one Dr. Gary Nolan of Stanford, Stanford scientist, who's a major character in her book, American Cosmic. So my question for everybody is, 
UFO researchers, academics, podcasters, authors. We are becoming one with the story. The story is becoming us, and we're becoming one with the story. Good, bad, or something else. Okay, and then I think right after me, it's actually will be Debs. You know, it's interesting. I think all the time about how things that are playing out will be in UFO books as history. Just like when we go back and read about Stan Freeman and go even further back and read about the original groups, like before MUFON, you know? Um, so I feel like no matter what is done, that's already, we're already part of the story, right? Um, the people who come out and speak on this topic, who try to organize, who try to push the topic into the public for people to have the conversation are already part of the story, no matter what. I don't think it's a bad thing to try to um, present it in a fictional way either, because at least it gets people to think. Um, so, I mean, that's what movies like Gattaca did. Like people still think about what the possible consequences could be for what we're doing now with CRISPR because of that movie. So I don't think it's a bad thing, but yeah, I think we're already, already part of the story. So yeah, air fryers have really taken off with that CRISPR. It's so, uh... <laughs> sorry, <Nathan. laughs> go ahead, Courtney. <laughs> You know, it hit, hits critical mass when on the back of your chicken strips, it gives you air fire prior instructions. Um, I think I think it's a good point that you, you get woven into the story. I mean, I'm not that, you know, high on the list or that compelling, but I can see the individuals from being involved long enough and reading their books and seeing their projects right now creatively, you know, creatively. I will say this. This is a really interesting part of all this. When I was at the uh, Archives of the Impossible in Houston, uh, two years ago, there was a bunch of really cool people there, you know, networking. And it was my first meeting with Diana Kasolka. And um, I was standing there and then another writer and, you know, she was new in the field. She was talking with her about her writing. And Diana just said to her spontaneously, you might be interested in this Amblin Emer Entertainment, you know, project that's coming about, you know, Japan and the Japanese viewpoints culturally on you know the gods and so this became encounters and the writer was you know marie she was there and so i think it's so interesting that these people <laughs> who show up who are interested in things might be experts might not they get woven into the story and it seems to be kind of like a synchronistic thing almost but i i do worry a little bit about objectivity you know, in the scientific approach of staying objective and looking at these subjects and subject matters objectively as much as we can. And I like the quote, Nietzsche's quote about, you know, becoming the monster, because that void really does look back into you, you know, especially in the UFO community. And so my major concern as a researcher is to try to continue to stay objective and not get subsumed with the personalities, with all of, with all of the the rich content because you can get subsumed by it. So that's one of the, you know, tight, you know, rope walks that I do is to try to continue to stay objective and look at both sides always too, not take one, well, not take one approach only. The great, <clears throat> the noted philosopher, Sammy Hagar said, saying, I see both sides now. I don't know if you've heard that song. <laughs> Nathan, cut, cut Courtney a check, man. <laughs> Courtney's on mute trying to talk. Party in the mail. It's on the, in All the right. mail. We're going to cut you a check, Courtney. So, uh, I'm sorry. It's the money man is next. <laughs> oh, I'm next. Okay, yeah. So, yes, I sir. mean, it's a great question. And, um, you know, I think talking about Dr. Pasolka, I mean, that's a huge focus of her work is really observing the downstream effects of these experiences, of these accounts, how it impacts individuals, how it impacts society. Uh, Darren and I just talked about the paper from Jacques Vallée and Eric Davis, the six layer model. One of the six layers is the cultural impact. And I think that that's, you know, hard to ignore. It's also interesting to me that we, you know, sort of live in a time where content is, is cheap, right? It's easy to make content easier than ever to make content. And that's only going to get even easier with the advent of these AI tools that really just can generate ideas like that uh, in, in video format, all kinds of different formats. So 
I think we're going to con continue to see the proliferation of, of content in this space. And Courtney, to your point, I think it is difficult to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff, the you know the, the good stuff from the bad, because there's just going to be so much flooding the zone there. And that's why this particular topic is so important. It's important to the state and the, the government specifically, because this is an opportunity for them, I think, to bring greater transparency to an issue that is just shrouded in in, in mystery for decades. And we live in a time when you know. We're, we're at a sort of high degree of, of skepticism of our governments. And this would maybe, I think, go a long way to restoring some trust in the public in our institutions. So if that could happen, that would be a huge you know, bonus, in my opinion. But it's going to require a lot of, I think, vulnerability, um, humble you know, sort of approaches, and people being able to put aside some of their political wins, really to sort of take a degree of culpability in the role the government has played in hiding a lot of this uh, material over the many years. You know, how do we restore a new model with the people so we can get information that is at least, I think, a little bit clearer as to what, what's going on. But, but it really is a challenge. And I think, you know, we, we see this from a lot of different angles. Obviously, we're biased being in the community of interest here. We think there is something to this. But for those who aren't in the community looking, you know, from the outside in at us, I think they would argue that, you know, the proliferation of these kinds of tools, it just really means we're going to be dealing with more and more, you know, sort of conspiracy communities uh, as we go forward. And I think some people will kind of bemoan that that's the case, because then it just becomes uh, everyone living in a world of their own sort of yeah. concoction creation you know i i believe this and i believe that and i have enough content around me to reinforce that belief and i don't really even need to operate in a world of common shared uh facts if you will and so it's it's a very interesting time that we're moving you know sort of forward into and i think it, it just further complicates this disclosure aspect right because it it just makes it that more challenging to try to get facts into the public conversation when there's so much distrust already at work here. My, my issue, Nathan, with the six layer model, it, it really has always been, where do I put the sour cream? Exactly. You know, Are you, you on the side you, or do you on the top? Like, how do you, yeah, I mean, which light, I mean, there, you have the, the beans, you know, you have the queso. It, Is it a dip? I don't, yeah. Yeah. I don't, I've struggled with that. No, all kidding aside, uh, with, with Dr. Pasolka, uh, we did have a discussion after we had her on about uh, her, her place and the difficulty that she faces. Um, you know, Tim, you know, has this title. Courtney is going to have this title of doctor. And then you've written a, a, a prolific book on the subject. And people expect you to come on and just rock their world and have the answer to every question that they have and, and come up with an intelligent, insightful answer. And it's very, very difficult to do. And there's a lot of pressure on her. At one point, she was just a religious teacher at a, at a, at a university. And now all of a sudden she's on a podcast, the biggest podcast on earth with over 15 million listeners to that podcast. So, um, it very difficult position that she's in. For me personally, I don't, I'm not a researcher. I consider myself an analyst. I've said that on these shows that I've been on, the Bigfoot shows and the UFO shows. I'm an analyst. So I'm just analyzing what I see and what I hear and using what I know with my background um, to evaluate what I'm seeing. But it can be very, very difficult, like Courtney said, to be able to not become. Uh, the story or, you know, and be able to distance yourself. And the problem for us is that we are all wrapped in this cocoon of humanity. We are limited by that. It's the only lens we can possibly have. And we, we have these things baked into us, the tribalism, you know, the, the, what about ism, you know, all these sorts of things, the skepticism. Um, and it's very difficult to, to try to be neutral as, as Courtney said, I know I've struggled with it, you know, when I'm listening to military guys and Air Force guys and making sure that I, I can sort of hold them and accountable. And there, Julie has a question, so we can get you in there next, Jules. Thank you. So, yeah, a great, great, great question and very, very difficult position. 
Um, who's next? Well, do I get to follow up on it? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thought? Yeah, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Sorry. Okay. No worry. And yeah. uh, I'll conclude my thoughts on this and I've got to run. I really appreciate all of you having right. me back home. So I just had two warnings with this. Mm -hmm. I want well, I want to congratulate people on finding success. I think it's amazing. But I have two warnings with this phenomenon. One, it's not a new phenomenon. In the 30s and 40s, and a man by the name of George Adamski, or Adamski, Adamski, right? He, mm -hmm. he rose to fame through his encounters with the phenomenon. And he, at some point, he might have had legitimate encounters and pictures of a cigar shaped ufo right and he went on what they called the ufo circuit even back then which was a lot of television and radio shows there was only one catch apparently the shows wouldn't and by the way they paid adamski and other people in this ufo circuit but they wouldn't ask them back on unless they had something new so okay. whereas adamski might have had something real in the beginning right he did devolve into some fraudulent activities including at some point claiming to have went to venus and meeting with venusians right so this is a problem even and i think even more so in our current society right like there is a big push for the next big thing all right we we got to constantly top ourselves and everybody you know you forget the news five minutes after you see it so this is a danger. My second danger is, back to Nitschke again, you know, um, at some point in our near past, our most brilliant minds in aerospace and physics have become wrapped up in things like satanic rituals and magic in the pursuit of advancements. And we still carry that danger with us. And I think we have to be very careful about how far and how deep into this we look. And I really Tim, appreciate having me back on. Tim, I just want yes, to say sir. brilliant comments, but Nitschke was the linebacker on the Packers' first Super Bowl team. So you the, meant Nitschke. Wait, the Packers won the Super Bowl? <laughs> yeah, against the Chiefs. Don't you remember Ray Nitschke, the great Packers linebacker? I don't know, maybe number six. I mean, I remember numbers. Tom Landry, Emmett Smith, yeah. Troy. I don't remember anything about these Packers you mentioned. Barry what? Sanders. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Warren Moon is a personal favorite of mine. Like, if we can oh work more at Warren Moon into, like, moon programs and bases, and I'm all I about I love it. Warren Moon. He you was too? awesome. He was awesome. Oilers, baby. Yeah. Get, me a, get me a oil. Earl yeah, Campbell. Going. That'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Bum Phillips with the cowboy hat. He goes, we can take Ewan and beat Hizen, and he can take Hizen and beat Ewan. So anyway, <laughs> all right. Let me get <laughs> Tim. Um, thank you very much. That is uh, Dr. Tim Mounts, the host of All Things Unexplained. Thank you, Dr. Tim. I thank appreciate you. I really you, enjoyed it. Thanks again. Thank I'll see you. all of you soon. Thanks. Yes, yeah, we'll be seeing you soon for our uh, Arla Williams uh, episode with um, yeah, all, with uh, Terry Terry Wendell. I'll be there, right. and I'm going to be broadcasting live from a secret location, which I'll reveal at that time. <laughs> By the way, I figured out what Tim, what the uh, the telescope, the James Webb. I think it's seen that Frisch's big boy from Austin Powers is out there. That's what it, it's going to tell us. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, Corinne's like, "What is this childish?" <laughs> All right, so um, here is <laughs> here is uh, Julie's question. Uh, Julie says. Did you see Ryan Graves discussing about how if you have a visual sighting, the critics want the data, and if you have multi-sensor data, they criticize for no visual witness. How do we approach? Yeah, um, I, it, it's ironic, Jules. I was just having this discussion with uh, Frank, our overseas co-host from UFO Thinker podcast, um, that he had on a guy who had had an amazing black triangle sighting in England when he was driving a taxi, just an amazing sighting. He is part of a group that he considers himself like half, half skeptic and, but experiencer. Uh, I think it's Finn three, six, five is, is him. And he was kind of trying to throw some water. You know, I, we're still not sure about the gimbal. And I'm like, well, 
the whole point of putting the Kimball video out by Lou and Chris is that it was genuine. That's why they picked those videos to release to the New York Times is they they had all the data. They spoke to all the witnesses uh, when he was part of a tip, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, OK, we got three real videos. That's the point. It's not so somebody can watch it with no data on their computer. And go, Oh, I see. It's lens flare. <laughs> I mean, that was the reason. The other thing is, as as the, if the cops and the robbers, you know, it's kind of like. John Voigt said to Robert De Niro in Heat, he said, this guy, Vincent Hanna, the Al Pacino character, he can swing and miss. You can't miss once. All Chris and Lou have to do is put out one fake video that people find out is fake, and that's it. They're over. No one would ever trust them again. They just needed to put out one that we could prove was manipulated, was fake, was fiddled with. Uh, and, and that would be the end of them. They, they couldn't possibly do that or their credibility. They would, no one would ever trust them and everything the skeptic said about them would be a hundred percent true. So that's the reason why those videos are in, in, impeachable because you don't have the data to look at, to say that, th to impeach them. That's the problem, uh, with that. So anyway, that's, that's my take on it. Jules, if the rest of the, the, uh, uh, panel wants to weigh in. Yeah, well, let's go to Deb on that. I think the um, again the issue is even when there are many many witnesses, like there were in the Phoenix Lights case, even when we have witnesses, many of them radar credible witnesses, by the way, and we have um, eyes on it, people still don't believe. They still think it's misidentified. They still <laughs> right. argue about it. Like it doesn't matter how much evidence you have when it comes to this topic because people have serious blinders on and they don't want to believe it. So. Right. I, I, absolutely. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I think it's Courtney. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So I just wanted to do um, a follow-up about um, Graves and make a comment about, you know, inside the CIA, you know, during the UAP task force before Arrow was established, there were people that were in the CIA that were working, you know, they get so much of their time, they get to donate to certain projects. And there are people inside the CIA that donated some time to the UAP task force to help out. And, um, you know, I talked with one of those individuals and he said, look, once you start looking and talking to people, even in the CIA, like their major person who was the representative for the CIA with the UAP task force said, yeah, this is just a bunch of pilots that you can't convince otherwise that, you know, it's something else. They're just convinced that it's, you know, these UAPs or UFOs. And so I think that's interesting. It doesn't go into sensor data, but it certainly goes into the perception of public perception and these interagency conflicts about the negation, the complete negation of even like the UAP task force as a serious investigative group working together interagency. And so I thought that was interesting that, you know, the, the main representative for the CIA was like, yeah, they're just a bunch of pilots that you can't convince otherwise. So I think that goes into other types of perception management about, you know, groups like the UAP task force. They just don't want to acknowledge it at all as serious. I just want to address your comment and I'll just tell you what the cabbies have heard me say before. I come from the air force special operations aviation community and for 13 years. And I will tell you that all data aside, sensor data, geospatial data, radar data from uh, sources that are external to the aircraft that's being flown that says they saw it. Like if there was an E2 or an AWACS or whatever, all data aside, the best people in the world at identifying objects in the air that don't make sense that are anomalous are these fighter pilots. That is exactly what they train for. We don't train for that. A lot of other types of aviators don't train for that. Although we kind of know what we're looking at, those people are the best. And that's without the data. You add the data in and it's okay. You know, it's so go ahead, sir. Yeah. I, I, so I think, first of all, I, I think he's presenting a very real problem because uh, we've yet to have that full package, right? So part of his complaint there is that we've got one or the other. We don't have both at least in the public sphere. We've heard that we have both. 
in sort of behind the scenes. And, you know, the Nimitz incident is a great example of that. You had eyes on uh, and you had sensor data and they have all of those you know, pieces. But we've really only heard about the eyes on testimony and what Kevin Day has reported from his, you know, analysis of the radar activity. But we've not seen that, you know, we've not seen that 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 sensor information. We're just taking it on witness testimony that it exists. So what we really would need is all of these pieces to be able to be put forward so that people can examine them in, a, in that sort of wholesome way. But it, you know, it is very challenging. It speaks to the enigmatic nature of this phenomenon generally. And I think it also is a little bit of a commentary on kind of where we are with our current uh, sort of perspective on our own view of reality. Like we, we're basically in a point in our history where we're saying officially that what you and I experience in the world is less valid than what sensors are are pro producing, providing, uh, you know, giving us data on about the world around us. In other words, we can't trust ourselves as as sensor platforms anymore. And so it's a strange place to be. It kind of almost like dehumanizes us in a way and takes our human experience out of the equation. And I think that's a, a particular challenge with the phenomena because it does seem to be very intricately related with the consciousness aspect. The, the, the experience is part of it. The human experience is part of it, not just what it's doing to sensors, but what is the person, you know, feeling, thinking, experiencing in, in the moment of that, as well as after that event takes place. So it's in some ways kind of challenging the current paradigm that we're in now, where we placed sensor data up here. And it's sort of asking us, is that is that valid to put sensor information about reality ahead of human experience, you know, and putting human experience kind of down to the side or disregarding it altogether as just we're easy to be duped, we're untrustworthy, et cetera, which in many cases is true. I mean, we're, we're very susceptible to like visual illusions and, and, and things of that it's nature. True. So I, I totally think that that's a valid concern. But, you know, this phenomena is, uh, is, I think, really challenging us just generally in how we understand what reality is. And we've yet to come up with a comprehensive way to incorporate it into our, into our operating paradigms about the world. And by the way, Calling All Beings is brought to you by DJ Skin Care Formula. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I'm just kidding. I'm gonna... I got to get them to stop. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't think Courtney's seen the DJ Skin Care Formula. <laughs> um, I yeah, haven't, but I've all about it. But I have a follow-up question for, yes, for, for you guys. Because one of the things that I think is curious, but it's another data point, right? When you're looking at this whole holistic picture of data and sensor data, you know, I've read that in multiple times and in, in the whistleblower testimonies to to Congress, they've said that the that the sensor data was um, was interrupted or jammed in multiple cases. And so I also think that that's feedback about sensor data when it's blocked by the, you know, the other craft, whatever it is, whether it was the Tic Tac or the gimbal. So I'm just wondering as a follow up, have you guys also heard that as well the, about the sensor data I being jammed? Yeah, I, I can speak. I can speak directly to that. Um, so there's two things. Just looking at at Tic Tac alone. So you had passive radars, which would be like the E2 Hawk Hawkeye is a lower power passive uh, mapping type of a radar, uh, air traffic radar, and the Spy One radar is also uh, a phased array you know, low power radar that has an incredible amount of sensitivity made to go over a broad area and be able to define pretty small objects. And then you have the fighter aircraft's attack radar, which is a high RF energy radar. So on two systems, they could see this craft and then the attack radar, it jammed. So that was a very interesting, uh, that was a very interesting thing that that object somehow had the intelligence to know this is danger. Um, it, this type of energy coming at our craft is danger and we need to block that. There's another one where um, I'm, I don't know, maybe one of you on the panel can help me, but it was one of those sort of MX-20 kind of L3 uh, sensors and they were trying to get a lock 
on uh, not, obviously in that one, the, the Tic Tac, that guy finally kind of got a lock on that. But there was another incident where they were trying to get a lock and they couldn't lock onto it. I think it was the one that Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Corbell, the jellyfish, they were trying to to uh, lock onto that object and they were unable to. Uh, that is not a radar. There is no radio signal uh, coming out of that device but yet it was able to prevent it from being able to put those two hash bars. Basically, it's looking for you to take your cursor, bring them in, bring them in, bring them in. It's supposed to see it, and then you squeeze a trigger, and it locks, and it's just going to follow it in, until the, the ball does like what they call a nader if it if it rotates in a, in a uh, area where it's being blocked by a part of the aircraft or whatever. In this case, it was on a uh, aerostat. But in any case, that that's what a nader is, is when all of a sudden it's not able to follow anymore. But they never even got to that because they never were able to lock on it. The other interesting part of that is it was not visible on NVGs from, uh, according to the Marine Corps Intel guy, the guys ran out of the jock. They put their nogs up. They could not see it, but they were seeing it on the MX-20 camera. Yeah, but very weird. what do we do with that? Right. <laughs> Right. I mean, that that's the issue, right? We can't seem it's to reproduce still data, it. though. Like, I think it's, you know, it's it novel information. It's novel data. When you look at this, you know, especially totally. when it's coming from an attack, you know, and then it's jammed, you can tell that there's some intelligence. I think that's important data not to forget. Or... Yeah, so that's a really good point. I mean, it's it's a data point like every other data point. And the fact that it's elusive and enigmatic, difficult to get, you know, on record that but it's you know you can understand why that frustrates our mainstream sort of scientific approach right we, we if we can't repeat this information if we can't record it then it just doesn't exist that, that, that's what's so to me is is frustrating about the kind of hardcore uh scientism materialism is that if we can't get it in a in in the form of bits and bytes on in computer information then it's not real right that that's kind of the place that we live now and uh, I think that this particular phenomenon just seems to defy that that way of of doing things, of understanding things. It's, I mean, we don't, we just don't have a better answer. It's, it's yeah. able to intelligently somehow defend certain things. Um, I think it's amazing that we were able to see that jellyfish. Well, I just got to ask you guys, starting with Debs, what was your first thought? And then Courtney, because it's just blowing my mind right now. Debs, what was your first thought when you saw that jellyfish uh, shape? Okay, well, you know me. I had to go look up and see if other people had seen something similar. And sure enough, there's this uh, phenomenon called the Medusa. Uh, you know, they call it the Medusa because like the Medusa jellyfish. And other mm -hmm. people had seen similar things. So I, I don't know what that was, but of course that's what I I did to handle it. I was like, I'm gonna go look into this. Courtney, what did you think when you saw that? That I mean, that... I thought it had a lot of shock value, and my first instinct was, you know, this is not real. I mean, I mean, it just it, it when I saw it, I just thought, you know, intuitively like. This can't be real. And so I did the same thing as, you know, Deb in a different way. I mean, I didn't find the Medusa, but I started looking up like what could cause these effects. And then you saw people on Twitter going through and looking at the infrared. And so I started looking at the infrared, what they were saying about the temperature changes and trying to look into some of that data and understanding. And I'm still I'm still out on it. I, I haven't decided. <laughs> so I'm still undecided. Money. Yeah, so, I mean, it's super weird, right? It, it it definitely had that effect, Courtney, on me, where you're like, this just kind of breaks the way you understand what would what should be appearing on that kind of footage. Uh, it reminded me as well of the redacted reports that we've seen, um, those flight reports. Um, what are they called, DJ? The uh, uh, I forget. There's a certain name for all these, like flight oh, DIRDs or something. Yeah, uh, oh, not the DIRDs. There's some oh. name for the flight. You know, range Fowlers. Right, range Fowlers. Thank you, Deb. That was it. Range Fowlers. Oh, okay. So these Range Fowler reports that we've gotten through like FOIA releases and stuff, they have a lot of these redactions. And it's like the objects looked like a blank, blank, in some instances like blank, and in other cases like, and you're just like, what kind of other shapes are we seeing? And why are those certain things redacted? Why are shapes redacted? You know, and I, there are certain reasons why, certainly. But, uh, 
it, it just makes you wonder what all kinds of things are are seen in the you know with the naked eye but also as you said dj with with instrumentation sometimes and and some instruments and not others yeah they're different spectrum that that mx20 i mean obviously if i took a six thousand dollar pair of um mark IV uh nvgs that i would wear on my helmet and then go outside the jock and flip those down you know like this is kind of like things seals would would when they're doing like a blacked out raid they actually have the ones they have ones and they have a little bit better field of view than what than what we have but their resolution's the same and you put that down and you don't see anything and then you run back inside and you can see that thing on an mx20 well it makes sense because that mx20 is you know several hundred thousand dollar you know camera so and it's they're they're huge i mean they're the size of a uh, they're bigger than a basketball so mm -hmm. they're they're quite quite the uh quite the device I, I was telling them before i left my last job i got to go in in um in the simulator and play around with the newer one than that the mx25 and i was just like oh my god i didn't even i mean it was just mind blowing. I, I barely could figure out how to operate it. Thank, thank God there was someone there to guide me through it. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I want to get to uh, Courtney's topic. So ma'am, please, you have the stage. Am I supposed and to propose a topic? Because I have one. I mean, oh, I can I please. can be impromptu on this. So I'm just wondering what you guys think about the the meeting in New York that David Grush had with special folks in the community where he talked about us having a stealth radar or some type of stealth tracking technology that we you know we have to track these uaps and that's one of the things that he you know it was leaked they were leaked you know screenshot images but i'm just wondering what you guys think about that if you have an opinion or what you you know Funny. what you weigh in on yeah well that whole thing was really interesting um the sort of private meeting with um wealthy people in new york and uh I think it was a real mixture of folks, you know, who different interested folks. But yeah, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me at all if we have ability to track these things in certain ways that we've, you know, really learned more about how to find them. I mean, Lou has alluded to that as well, that we know sort of certain, you know, frequencies or signals that they can put off that help us, you know, Id identify them in, in certain places. So, and, and Chris Mellon has sort of mentioned this too in a lot of his, um, opinion pieces you know where he's talking about uh the fact that like the national reconnaissance office has all this amazing data and why aren't they weighing in why haven't they talked about you know the things that they are collecting or just you know hoovering up all this data around the globe all the time and surely in that collection we've been able to you know identify some of these crafts so yeah it's 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 very very interesting to me um and i wish you know david gresh would do more things but at the same time, he strikes me as a person that, you know, he's going to do things that have an impact. And so I'm hoping that the next time we actually hear from him, it, you know, it's a really impactful, he's doing it for a reason. It's the right time to say more. This is a, a really interesting topic. I, I don't know of the technology, but if I were to take a, a really wild guess, because the whole idea or one of the ideas behind the way that we do stealth, which is different than the way that the Russians do it is that those shapes, you know, that the, the radio signal um, radar is basically, it's a, it's a frequency of, of radio signal is supposed to go out, bounce, come back. And based on how long it takes to do that, um, that's how you can judge your speed relative to that. And so that's kind of how it builds a picture for you is by the radio beams hitting like an aircraft and coming back. It's a receiver transmitter so you transmit receive transmit receive and then it builds a picture and there's all kinds of signal processing that goes on the magic is in some in some ways is not so much the signal that goes out and come back but the processing that happens in the receiver transmitter when you get that signal back and that can be used for a lot of different things for us we used it for low level flying we want to fly 250 feet off the ground well we need to be able to map the terrain very accurately because we're flying below the terrain and the theory is that it's cloud cover and you can't see so all those radar returns are going to tell you when to turn left and right or you'll you'll hit a mountain so i and so now this stealth craft they're shaped in such a way 
the angles of them, the geometry of these craft is that when the radar beam hits it, it bounces off and goes away and doesn't come back to the receiver transmitter. So it's unable to process that signal. And so your return, instead of getting something like, oh, shoot, this looks like the size of an FA-18. Well, shoot, I might have something that looks like a beach ball or something of that size, or it could look like a big bird or something. So that's one of the ways that it works. The other thing is that the skin, the material of the skin, absorbs a portion of that radio signal and also doesn't offer the return that you would want to get as someone who's targeting and trying to shoot down that aircraft. I'm guessing, if I had to take a guess without any knowledge, I've never heard of this system before Courtney mentioned it, that there's this thing called uh, digital terrain elevation data. So if you wanted to fly in the terrain, but if you shoot your radar out there, then someone with a passive detector note can see that you're coming and that you're flying. So if you want to turn that off, well, how can you safely do it? You're basically using like digital terrain elevation data, DTED, and it'll build the terrain in front of you based on like mapping data. So what if they shoot something like that out at a craft and then it it builds out based on the velocity that it's going? Oh, that must be an aircraft. It's going 560 knots. It's obviously not a bird. And then maybe it using that data, it can build out something of what it thinks that that cr- craft must be based on whatever factors that is programmed into it. I'm guessing it might be something like that, but that is a complete guess. That's a great, that's a great guess. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Can I just chime in also that we've had other people from the government tell us that we're surveying these objects, including John Ramirez. He's told us that they had a whole working group trying to identify what they were seeing with satellites. So I just wanted to throw that out there as a reminder. And that's my two cents on that. That's a, I mean, that, that, that is some of the the most deeply classified stuff is that geospatial data. And I believe that every one of those videos that has been put out by Elizondo, they have the geospatial data to back up what it was. He alluded to that in several interviews Mm -hmm. that they have data that you haven't seen. And, uh, John has said, you know, hey, uh, they can see a softball from space. You know, they can. So they said what Google Maps has, <laughs> that what well, is it's way better than that, a higher resolution than that. So I don't have any independent knowledge other than what I've heard the same thing you guys have heard. So anyway, um, so I had two topics. So I'd like you guys to choose what my topic would be. One of them was something that was mentioned on that show with, um, help me out with his name, Matty from Boston, Matt and Willis. Yes. Yeah. So, um, on that show, they were talking about that there was a scientist that wanted to study, um, the removing of embryos and so forth from women and woman was pregnant and she's abducted and she's not pregnant anymore, things like that. And Bud Hopkins and another famous scientist who I don't recall his name and you guys may, Deb may, um, uh, did not want to talk to him. Jacobs. I think Jacobs. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. It was Jacobs. Thank you. And they said that they, they, they did not want to entertain that discussion whatsoever. The second topic was going to be something that that you guys talked about on liminal frames is the uh, extraterrestrial and or the interdimensional hypothesis. So which would you guys rather me uh, give for for my topic? Let's do interdimensional because I I have complaints about this. (laughs) I I I went on a deep dive on what quantum physics is trying to say when they're saying there are multiple dimensions. And I understand that I am not a quantum theorist or physicist, I get that. But if you go to the crux of it, it's basically that all things are possible because at the quantum level, everything's pretty random. 
So it's like the Schrodinger's cat thing. It, you don't know what's going on with the cat inside the box. That is not, it's, it's kind of woo to me. Honestly, quantum physics and their explanation for why there's multiple dimensions. It, to me, like they, I know they have math that they say supports this, but there's nothing solid for me on the dimensional theory. To me, Occam's razor is that there's generational ships or something on the planet that was already here. The dimension thing is just way too far out there for me. Sorry. So we're not having a democratic vote on this. Uh, uh, <laughs> our our resident autocrat, Deb, has decided it will be dimensional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First of all, Bob Marley is in is in the chat, so we always say Irie Man, Irie Bob Marley. What's up, Bob? So what's up, Bob? <laughs> Wait, can can you do a Jamaican accent, Courtney? I feel like you can. No. I don't know. It's like no. Okay. I, I just go into sing, I just go into singing like Toots in the Maytals, Funky Kingston, and nobody wants to hear that. I <laughs> so, that I I have them on my phone. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Court. It's what I got. Yeah. <laughs> I thought she was going to say after my doctoral thesis. But anyway. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Nathan, who, let's see. So we went to depth. So Courtney goes first on. Uh, yeah, let's, on let's this. go. I didn't even get to. St well, okay. <laughs> Do I state my position first? Okay. Well, yeah, go ahead. So, That's fine. Okay. So I, I guess what I'm saying is that. Um, could let's say there's an extraterrestrial uh, from another planet that has visited Earth, just for the sake of discussion, couldn't they have used the the interdimensional mode of travel to arrive here? Yep. And why is that not as re you know, especially since experiencers report that that they're being told whether they're being told the truth or not, we don't know, but many have said that they said they are from another planet, including, uh, um, Dan Sherman, uh, you know, his discussion with that, that ET that he was, uh, communicating with on behalf of the government. So, um, who goes after. So I, on that basis, I think it's as possible as one to the other, just because the mode of travel might not be, Hey, Scotty, take it to warp eight and let's see mm -hmm. when we get to earth. It just could be that they're using the inner interdimensional travel, just like the ones that perhaps were always from here. So anyway, go, uh, who's, who's after me, Debs. So uh, I have to say, wait, oh, after you, you, do you want me to say this again? <laughs> oh, you already said it. Okay. <laughs> fine. Courtney, Mark Asani. Okay. So I think, I can say that, you know, I, I am like you, Deb, I'm no expert, but, you know, I was able to see Brian Green in Seattle when I lived there. When he came out with String Theory, I went to a town hall. I listened to him, you know, with all the Seattle, you know, top intelligentsia, you know, they were all there and um, we've been stuck, you know. I mean, there's a lot of complaints about the fact that we're kind of stuck. We haven't done anything beyond String Theory and String Theory doesn't necessarily explain the different dimensions, but I know there's a whole nother science about the dimensions and how they fold in on one another and string theory is connected to it. But one of the things I will say is I, that I haven't been exploring just through experience or reports is about consciousness and how consciousness might be the key, right, to unlocking some of this dimensional stuff. Because one of the things that the experiencers describe, and it's anecdotal, it's just case studies, but one of the things that they describe is this different time or temporal changes that they experience during encounters. And so I do think it's, a, you know, like a working hypothesis that people put out there, but I certainly don't understand how interdimensionality works with regard to consciousness, but I'm really fascinated by it. And I want to learn more um, about how the interdimensions work, because I have been told by a whistleblower, I will say this, is that there's a difference between the NHI that are here that are supposedly working with our own government already and has been documented through their testimony to Congress and these other ones that they call interdimensionals. So it's just a subject matter that I'm curious about and also wanting to learn about it, but I certainly don't know how it works. And so I think that that's a conundrum for everybody. And it would be great to have some of these physicists, you know, physicists describe it, you know, how the interdimensionality would work with consciousness is something I'm also pursuing, but I don't understand it. You know, you got to admit what you don't know. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, hundred percent. And I think that's a great point because 
um, interdimensional right now in the conversation seems to me to be really used as more of a catch-all. It's not necessarily um, something that has a concrete understanding. I think that we're, what, what I look to, the, when I see people using that, what I'm getting from it is we're trying to mature the conversation beyond just the classic extraterrestrial hypothesis because what we are hearing about from witnesses, people that are in these programs, et cetera, seem to complicate the picture and make it not as straightforward as it just being beings from another planet in the galaxy like our planet, that it's a more complicated situation than that. So that is, I think, I mean, I'm a positive person. I'm looking at this positively, that like this is taking us, trying to move that conversation into a, a good direction away from the classic way of looking at this as just extraterrestrials. Um, and of course, Darren and I talked about too, like at some point these definitions start, kind of start collapsing on one another because DJ, you know, to DJ's point, if they're coming from some other place, traveling through space time to get here, does that then make them interdimensional visitors? Are they, if it's time travel, is that inter interdimensional? Uh, you know, there are all kinds of elements here that really confuse the issue and, uh, you know, I think make it quite complicated. But um, hopefully we're moving kind of closer to a better working theory than, than what we've had. And I think just the fact that lawmakers are willing to talk about this and put forward an interdimensional hypothesis as a potential idea is a positive sign. And Nathan, uh, uh, Dan Sherman, when he spoke with Bones, I think the second of the, uh, of the two uh, ETs that he was charged with communicating with on on a daily basis, he said that I think, and you guys that have watched it may have to correct me. He said, we bend time when he asked him about how they travel. He said, we bend time, whatever that means. So I, you know, and yeah, again, that's part of it. The best part of that story I love is when he's like out in the shack, you know, <laughs> connecting mm -hmm. to the thing. And I think the most novel part of his story, when I read it so long ago, this is just my memory, but this is a part yeah. that I love is that he, he didn't get off the line. Do you remember that? There was one time where there was like, he was supposed to cut yes, connection yes. and he didn't get off the line. And yes. the interlocutor, whoever it was that was above, was like, are you still there? You know, and there was this, I mean, that was just yes. one of the fascinating things from that book that I thought he was still on the line. And then they had this whole separate conversation, like you shouldn't, you shouldn't be here. And- Can um, they monitor us? And he said, no. His counterpart said, no, they can't. Right. Yeah, so that I'll was send you the that interview that I with really him. liked about that book. Can I, I, I wanted to chime in on this yeah. um, idea of physics for a moment. So again, I think the idea of dimensionality is problematic. But when you're talking about the bending of time and space time and things like that, when you get into like the, the weeds of what's going on in physics, they have some explanations, you know, including for like how mass changes um, so I'm not saying that there's no explainable science to what they're doing. What I'm saying is that a lot of people are misunderstanding what quantum physicists were trying to say about interdimensionality. They're not all on the same page about that either. And they're not really talking about necessarily um, a parallel world that we can traverse to and from. Um, so it's not exactly what they're talking about. <laughs> So, I want, but yeah, that's all I wanted to say. That's a great point. I want to, I want to correct one thing. Nathan and I have talked about this. When, when Dan Sherman says he told me, he makes it clear to you. He didn't say this to me. He's conveying things to me that are far richer than conversation and thought. It's a richer experience. I am then trying to take what came to me and translate it into English. So when I say bend time, the the being didn't say to him, we bend time. He said something that Dan then was able to interpret and translate with his human brain into that. And again, he's an Intel guy. He's not a, a physicist. So who knows what that conversation may have been like if that Bones was talking to Eric Weinstein. Or something well, you know what i mean well so. in physics they say that mass does bend time like so if for instance <laughs> i was watching a video because uh, i like to watch the ones about whether or not we understand reality 
Um, and they said, because our feet are closer to the planet, our feet are younger than our the top of our head. So basically, like mass <laughs> impacts time. So things that are um, further away um, may age slower, for instance. So it literally, if uh, if something is bending time, it's literally related to mass. So yeah, that's a science thing. So. I'm glad you brought that up, you know, and there's a really good book. I don't know, Deb, if you've read this or not, because we've never talked about it before, but it's called Time's Arrow. It's like a classic. And they go into a lot of that in Time's Arrow, where they talk about mass and time. And they don't necessarily go into bending time, but they go into all that physics surrounding Time's Arrow and it just going forward. So I'm, I'm not sure if you read that or not, but I wanted to mention that before we click off. And then the other thing I wanted to mention, which relates to what you were saying, DJ, is that one of the things that the whistleblower has reported that I think is fascinating about, it's the same as Dan Sherman's story, but a little different flavor, is that when there is a telepathic connection, whether it's through that computer that Dan Sherman is connecting through, or it's actually with NHI face-to-face, one-on-one, that they connect in a way that the emotions of that person is, is uh, they're activated in a way to help the other individual feel what the NHI is trying to convey. But that becomes very complex in the interface between the NHI. But the other thing that they shared was that they leave with you a memory. So this is also time, right? And memories and NHI, you know, inter interface that it's not your memory, it's their memory that they leave with you. So that's just something that I just wanted to share in this conversation about time and memory and interfacing with the NHI that we don't necessarily understand, but it's it's part of it. You know, we know that it's all part of it, of this interface with NHI and communication. Yeah, it's, this is so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry no, to interrupt Nathan. No, you're good, go. It's just such a fascinating topic. We could just go for, for hours on it. Um, and we will again. Um, I also want to, if you haven't seen the interview, Courtney, I'll send you the Dan Sherman interview. Have you seen it? No? No, okay. but I've brought him up a lot lately because the whistleblower's testimony sounds a lot like Dan Sherman's experiences. And so I kind of associated them through the interface, the NHI interface. Oh, it, it's... Uh... It, it's he doesn't embellish upon the book, but the interviewer is fantastic. I don't know who the, the, the woman is who interviews him, but her questions are brilliant. And she really is able to get you some clarity and to expand a little bit like. A, but he's not going to build upon stuff that he said, you know, this is what happened. This is what I know. And beyond that, I don't know. Like he said, when I typed into the box. The, the the sequence of numbers and virgules that that uh, he told me I don't know where that what what that information was or where it went but then he figured out when he figured out that there were coordinates that pissed him off and that was actually the beginning of the end of his participation in the program but I will send you the interview because uh, um, he's just a very forthright guy um, parting shots from everybody do I get to do my topic <laughs> Oh, you had a topic? Oh, sorry. I didn't <laughs> Just, know you didn't have one. I'm, I'm sorry. I missed that. Go that's ahead. okay. I'm going to do it real quick. So I was, <laughs> so I, was I was watching American Alchemy today, or I should uh -huh. say listening. I was, that was what I was listening to. You, and it was Our so fascinating. Yeah. Um, they were talking about anti-gravity uh, research that was done and um, Towson Brown. Um, and basically the government's potential cover up of that work. Um, so I'm going to just pose this question and we can do a quick hitter response on this maybe, but don't you think that if some of this stuff was the government trying to keep uh, like, you know, black projects black, that they would also equally um, be, how should I put this, put on the chopping block by the public for doing some of the things they've done to keep it black? Say that, just raise the question one more time to make sure I have it, and then okay. So, the so the 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 thing that Jesse Merkel's had been touching on was that 
the anti-gravity work, they were probably trying to keep some of that secret and might have done some things like put Bob Lazar into the public eye to cover up some of the work that they had done. And I feel like that might be something that the public would penalize them for, for some of the things that they may have done to keep those projects black. I think that it would be equally um, controversial, actually. So Ms. that's Courtney. just... I get I totally get it. Yeah, I definitely think the public is going to pe penalize <laughs> just quickly. Like, you know, it, this is a science that should be shared to humanity. I mean, it's like Brian Greene doing his tours and talking about string theory and getting the information out to the public so we could understand it. So we can understand physics. And there's a teaching component to that. And so to keep it black and to keep it covered up, there's no doubt the public will, there will be an uprising. I mean, we're still finding about, about programs still that the government has covered up because of secret experimentation and other things. And, and there's definitely going to be outcry. So if that's the case, there's no doubt there'll be a, there'll be a callback. Nathan, uh, Brian Green, uh, 90210 and then string theory, very talented guy. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, absolutely. Uh, there's a dark history here. Right? There's a dark history of um, of obfuscation, of uh, suppression of this information. That's what we're hearing, at least. You know, we've heard people have been killed for some of these secrets, and so that can include some of our own governmental secrets, um, not just things we may have reverse engineered. Uh, it's possible that this technology is is not that complicated. I think this is where, where it gets a little bit more challenging because if some if if anti-gravitics or electrogravitics or whatever if the secret to that tech isn't really that complicated let's, let's say it's far simpler to create an electrogravitic craft than it is to create a, a nuclear weapon or a biological weapon then you have a situation here where you could potentially be able to create this technology and it could be very dangerous so you know the fact that it, it maybe was suppressed is suppressed could very well be for the benefit of you know other people because we just don't want this proliferated you know around the world. Um, I'm just playing the devil's advocate there. I, I don't know that that's the case, but I'm just saying it's possible as a reason, an early justification they made for keeping it secret, covering it up, and doing what they did. Again, it's pure speculation. Um, my opinion, I think that's great speculation. Uh, I. I have said uh, these guys have heard me on many occasions, even though Courtney hasn't. I I'm sure they've been working on anti gravitics and trying to um, actualize that technology um, such that we believe that that's how they are powering their craft. We really don't know that for sure that that's uh, the the mode of propulsion that they use. We we're assuming that, and you know it, it's it's some pretty good guess, but I don't think that it's been actualized beyond a laboratory type setting because if if they had been able to then we would be probably building craft with it there's also something that um a lot of the the scientists talked about how the tic tac went from 50 feet above the water and it zoomed up to 80,000 feet that wasn't the 0.78 seconds the 0.78 seconds was from 28,000 feet to sea level but the amount of energy that it would take um, is something that is very, very difficult to put aboard a craft. Like, for example, I know of a program that had put a laser on an aircraft. And the biggest problem with this was the amount of generators like DC type generators and batteries it took to fire it and would take up the weight that you might use conventional munitions for. So that is, was a challenge. Um, so, um, so I, I don't think that we've gotten to the level that, uh, that we're flying craft around with any gravitics. I think it's probably at the laboratory level. And I don't think, I think Bob Lazar, uh, story personally, I think everybody, you guys all know what I think on this is that I, I take his his story at face value, not because I just want to believe that, but there's a lot of different factors around that, things he said, things that he knew, 
Um, George, just work on it. Um, George's tentacles in the Vegas area to know a lot of people inside programs to know what's going on out there and be able to bounce that against what, what Lazar did. Plus obviously the, the uh, evidence of Los Alamos. And I think his story is just what it was. He got to go work on things and, um, you know, he came out and decided to talk about it. It's very easy to refute people like him because, um, Nobody believes him. Nobody believes the alien interview. Nobody believes uh, the story's been out uh, of Dan Sherman for years. Nobody believes him. It, they don't really have to do a lot of hard work. <laughs> they have to do a lot of hard work when it comes to like a David Grush or a Lou Elizondo. That's work. Um, Bob Lazar and, you know, Dan Sherman, that's not work. That's like what Susan Goff would call her light work. <laughs> so she's like what <laughs> i don't even have to talk about this because nobody believes it anyway right this isn't gravity deb but i just want to i just did have a follow-up comment that i thought was maybe a little relevant but it was going to the comment that maybe this is not all not all that technical like we think it might be and um at the soul symposium one of the things that kevin knuth did and now those videos are out so you can go watch this but he talked about when the craft or the anomalous object hovers over cars that the one thing that perturbed him was that you hear all these witnesses talking about their batteries going dead and he thought to himself this is ludicrous why would the battery go dead so then he used this formula this mathematical equation to do battery voltage, right? And then how it would potentially run down because of this interaction with the craft. And I went up to him after and I was like, I'm so glad that you explained this, you know, can you give me the formula? He's like, Courtney, it's really easy math. <laughs> you know, like all you have to do is do the voltage on the battery. Cause I wanted to go and look at like my dad's car, which was a Corvair that's batteries went dead when, you know, the craft hovered over. And so I think there is something to that, the simplicity of some of this. And I'm not sure about gravity, but I do think that there are probably people working on this. And they're working on gravity to understand the gravitics of the craft. And, you know, as a simple oh, yeah. thing, like an explanation of the battery, you could look at this large S, the larger picture that's I'm happening. Gonna, and it's probably not as complicated as we think it is. No, I'm going to say that if I can understand <laughs> how it can be done, then it's not that complicated. And a hundred percent other countries are working on it too. Like it's, it's like, they, it's explained um when you watch the american alchemy um video a little bit but it, furthermore if you guys look into the science of plasma it'll explain it even further and it's pretty easy actually to do can can we say hi to linda thompson a legend is in the chat right now hi linda thompson how are you buddy it's good to see you in here don't realize didn't realize Courtney was on. Oh, that's what it takes to get you in the chat is Courtney. I don't blame you. No, um, what I would say, Courtney, and these guys have heard me say this uh, many, many times. And it, it's very difficult for people to understand that don't understand flight. So when you talk about theories, I can do this. I can draw it on a board. And I can say the math is this and this is how that happens. And that's how. Now I have to go and propel something in four. So I have to be able to power it going up, coming down, going left and going right. There's not an aircraft on the planet that does that at this point. That's the other so, thing he said. I'm glad that you brought that up because that was the other segue into this whole other talk that Kevin Knuth was talking about in, in kind of like a private audience where he was talking about the way they lift off the way they move and how they're different and how they take off and they move off and you know, these very different ways. So I'm glad you brought that up. That was some, one of the points that he made actually at the conference. Yeah. Actually, we're trying to replace all these French things, fuselage, aileron, the elevators, the rudder, you know, the X, Y, Z axis, all with a propulsion system that we can't see that doesn't produce heat but yet is able to make it move at right angles. And you so you can propel thrust from the, the top of it to push you down and then be able to modulate that to slow you down so you don't smack into the ground. Or the, there's so many challenges to do what they're doing. 
that's why Fravor says he thinks that they're hundreds or thousands of years ahead of us. I don't know. I, w- I couldn't even guess, but I just know that, <laughs> that they're in, in my opinion, they're way, way ahead of us because, um, as I told, uh, Nathan, and I had this discussion. It took us 130,000 years of modern humanity to achieve powered flight. So, so from the beginning of man to the Wright brothers is like 130,000 years. And then from that to the moon was what? 63 years or something like that. 66 years. Yeah. Uh, so we were able to do that. But this is a whole nother leap because we require the air in order to not only propel our craft, but to steer it. They don't require that. Yep. They don't need the air to maneuver. In fact, they can maneuver in the water even. <laughs> so, so so it's it- it's a whole nother level that I just don't think that we've cracked that yet. Well, I they did say that we used part of it for some of our craft, like the B-52s, I think, were mentioned. So it's worth, um, if you can watch that and let us know what you think about what they say about that, that I'll be interested. I don't think they have um, necessarily put a whole large craft out with this, but what they were working on were fairly small models anyway. And That's what I'm saying. That's exactly no, I yeah. said in a laboratory environment. Right. It's but, different to put it in a tactical engagement with an FA 18. That's a whole different ballgame. Right. Game. Right. So, but I'm saying. And then that, have it disappear. <laughs> so, there's so that I'm too. saying, saying there's some use for that though. And they probably sure. did use it. And I think that, um, I think the fact that they might have used it and some people might have mistaken it for something else um, is a possibility. And I think that that could be harmful, you know, because people don't understand what they're seeing. And I think the point of my question is there should be some culpability for that. I don't think it's okay to scare people if you're throwing something, even a drone, like people are, there's restrictions on drones so that it's not harmful to other people. But I mean, that's my perspective on it. But yeah, if, if to in my view, what I've said this also many times, if they are flying around some kind of tech, they're not flying it around Des Moines and Four Corners and suburban Virginia, where you know Linda has seen some some crazy things. They have test ranges where you test these things, so that if you crash it, you're not crashing into a civilian community and having to explain what this tech is that you've just crashed into somebody's townhouse in Chantilly. So they have test ranges like area 51 and others. So um, I'm sure there are many people who have seen the B2. That's the one that you're talking about that they supposedly are using this ionization to create lift in the wing. I don't, I've, I've never heard that from any air force guys. So I don't know if that's true, but um but uh, I could see people seeing the B-2 and thinking it's a UFO. And I can see people definitely seeing the F-117, which is uh, not in service anymore, and thinking that's a UFO, 100%. Uh, but if you listen, you'll hear the engines, depending upon how far away it is. But it may be far enough away where you wouldn't necessarily hear it. But you, if they rolled you know, 40 degrees bank, you'd be like, oh, my God, there's a flying triangle. That's exactly what it would look like. So I totally get that. Yeah, that's a great it's point. time to it's time to cut it for tonight, though. Um, so parting shots by everybody. <laughs> uh, let's let Courtney go first. Well, I just want to say thank you for having me. You know, it was nice to be able to share about my takeaways from the Soul Symposium. That was a very special event that I was able to go to, and it's nice to be able to share that. You know, with calling all beings. So thanks for you know having me, so I can give some of those takeaways to your audience. Yeah, great to have you with us. Did you think of that song from Coming to America, the Soul Glow song during the Just let your soul glow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm like Rain Man. I'm like Rain Man, you know, with the songs and the 80s and the 90s. You call it out and I'll be able to put, able put her to back it. on screen again, Nathan. Hold up. <laughs> Hold on. Where, where's she at? Put her. There you go. 
Courtney, thank you so much for making our night. It was an honor to have you. We gonna want to have you come back uh, and co-host with us uh, when you can. You are just so much fun. Thank you so much. I appreciate thank you it. guys. All right. Uh, parting shot, Debsy Websy. Yeah, I think it was a great night. A lot of things to mull over, you know, everything from reality to black ops to interdimensional those. So that's a lot we covered in one night. I appreciate that. Um, and hopefully, you know, one day, you know, the near future, according to Joe Mergia, Eric Davis says like 10 years, we'll get some answers. <laughs> Deb, can we do stolen embryos on the next episode, though? Um, yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> I will try to not go over what we're already doing with that too much. I love it. Somebody said Chinese takeaways. <laughs> Someone's got our sense of humor. Thank you, Mick. We appreciate you. Brother. <laughs> Nathan. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it's been a super fun night tonight. A great conversation. And uh, thank you folks in the chat too. Uh, some really good comments there. Uh, if you haven't yet done so, please give us a like and subscribe. Uh, we're planning to do more of these like once a month uh, off the meters every once in a while because I think they are a good time and it gives us a chance just to have a free-flowing conversation without a specific kind of interview s uh, setup that we normally do. But uh, it's been a really good uh, show. And uh, Courtney, again, thanks for coming with us uh, to, for the show tonight. Look forward to having you back. Yeah. Wait, I can't. My wife's sleeping or I'd yell out amen. <laughs> I've already done that, but yeah, man, <laughs> a quiet amen. Yeah, quiet amen. Uh, so yes, thank you so much. It, it everything Nathan said, it was just so much fun. Julie, thank you once again for doing a fantabulous job in the chat. Mick for being the brother. Oh, look at that, Anon Et. Hope you have a good night. Thank you so much for coming back. Uh, anomalous debates. Oh, look at that. That is, I don't know if that's. I don't know if that's Courtney or Debs, but it's one of them. Also, um, if you're out there in the community and you're wanting to debate, uh, Tim is going to try to get someone, Dr. Tim Mounts, to debate. But come on the show, Lincoln Douglas style, and let um, Deb and Courtney moderate this debate. You're going to have a good time, and we're going to see what kind of chops you got. We're going to see if you're on their level or if you're on the level of your whoever your opponent is. So. Um, so for Courtney, for Debs, for Money Nathan, this is DJ saying peace out, one love. We'll see you down the road. And of course, we're always wondering what's up around the bend. <laughs>